welcome to our third backstage conversation. Barry and I are happy that you all have joined us. My conversation today is with Robin Rice, who's a maker of fine visual arts and honored and published and performed playwright. She's written more than 100 plays, uh, 24, and her work has been performed around this country and elsewhere abroad. Uh, she entered Antioch in, what year did you enter Antioch? 59. Yeah, that's what I thought. Way back uh, then. One part of her autobiographical play, uh, Suki Livingston Opens Like a Parachute, um, touches on Antioch. Um, she ran the work project starting in the 90s for 10 years and uh, does the and does the um, and has been on the alumni board. So please join me. We're very fortunate to have her today because over the past couple of years she's developed an aversion to Zoom. I guess if you're a playwright, it's not much fun to hear your play or try to work with actors on Zoom. Anyway, uh, please join me in welcoming Robin Rice. Thank you, thank you. I feel honored, actually. I am honored. Well, we're honored. We're more honored than you're honored. <laughs> because I wasn't really, except for one play, I wasn't in theater at Antioch. It was too right. much fun. You were in The Boyfriend with Phil Fox. Oh, Phil well, Fox, senior project. Yes. You and the boyfriend with Roy London. Roy London, yes. Um, could you talk about growing up in Williamstown, Massachusetts? Yeah. Um, and it, as I said before, in thinking through what we're going to talk about, I realized collaboration is the theme of the day. Um, and it starts with that monologue that Paula knows that I wrote about when I was a little kid walking as well. We, I always went barefoot everywhere, walking in the Green River and coming upon a, a bank that was made of clay. It was greeny gray and very smooth. So naturally, my sister and I just filled our pockets and filled whatever we had with clay and took it back and made things. This, ah, uh, Neela remembers Phil. I'm reading, I should turn the chat off here so I'm yeah, not distracted. Right. Right. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> and, that, and that was, that, that is just an example of how living in the country in Williamstown, I lived in town, but we were always out. I hardly ever wore shoes. Um, we're laying on the ground, watching the insects, you know, the birds, the bat, dancing with the bats in the evening. And <laughs> nature is, is just part of, uh, uh, part of me very much. I'm so grateful that actually I didn't grow up a city kid but I've got all of that. And my, my family was environmentalist just from the very beginning. My grandmother in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania chained herself at, at the age, she was, she was in her late eighties, I think, or early nineties, chained herself to a tree so they wouldn't cut it down. So wow. this, goes, this goes way back. Um, well, you also got involved in theater. And uh, yeah, I, um, I was actually art and theater and nature go all the way through the whole the whole deal uh, and writing because I was also in high school I was editor of the newspaper and the yearbook and all of that um, at Williams College I, I was also one of my jobs was working in the news director's office there so this all comes in later but at Williams well the Williamstown Summer Theater which is now the Williamstown Theater Festival and is really big uh, I was house manager there three summers, so I just lived in the theater and I got to know hobnobbed with Yale grad students who included Dick Cavett, Austin who you, Pendleton. You, who you dated? Briefly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that's my claim to fame. <laughs> um, and, and it was very, very important living in a being brought up in a college town, a small college town, Williams, very good school. I actually got got out of high school early and went to Williams for a year. Um, culture, music, theater, all of that was right there. I think everybody deserves to be brought up in a small college town. <laughs> Near the country. 
right. near with the country right there. So you can just walk out your back door and walk in the river. Yeah. So how did you get to Antioch? Does anybody know Dan Norton? I can't remember his wife's name. They were both Antiochians and they were good friends of my parents. So here I was going to Williams, which is of course an excellent school, but it's pretty tight laced, pretty starch collared mm -hmm. and kind of, mm -mm. I was majoring in architecture, which was also, they weren't, people weren't like free. They were going to be architects, uh, <laughs> and lawyers and doctors, all those Williams people. So when Dan and his wife started talking about Antioch, when, cause I couldn't graduate from Williams cause it wasn't a co-ed school yet. Uh -huh. So they would have let me go three years, but I couldn't graduate from there. And I, anyway, I wanted to get away from home. They started talking about Antioch. And I mean, it was the whole, the whole thing right there. Co-op jobs. Absolutely. There we go with collaboration. Learn through doing. Um, I just was, got rid of all these other schools. I was supposed to be going to um, Tufts. They wanted me to go to. <laughs> the others were just did not appeal at all and also ohio sounded like it was nice and far away from massachusetts yeah. <laughs> um though yellow springs is not all that different from williamstown actually uh-huh uh -huh. so you came to antioch and um the world opened a, yeah you weren't a theater major didn't you start out in art or? I started out in art and just like theater, art seemed like it was just too much fun for what dad was paying. <laughs> it was very expensive, Antioch was. I had a scholarship, but still it was really expensive. Yeah. And I had three little sisters, you know, coming up behind me. So I thought, uh, oh, well, at the same time that I was realizing I felt a little guilty for having fun majoring in art. At the same time, I took a class with Mickey McCleary, political science, and I just totally fell in love with that. Um, and civil rights activism was, was really strong at that time in Antioch. And I, um, the combination of the activism and political science with Mickey McCleary, I got, after a couple <laughs> tries, I was accepted into his private seminar group in his home. It was so exciting and that's worth the tuition money. You know, that's a good, good heavy major. Right, right. And that also fed into my reporter, reporter newspaper proclivities, which continued later. Right, yeah, it was a very politically charged time. Um, so, but you dropped out of Antioch. Well, I, First, I, let me I say very quickly, I thought about this and I realized how my co-op jobs, here we go with collaboration. They not only were the, through the job learning things, but every I had four co-op jobs when I was there. Uh, and each one was where I could also take a course at a college or university. I taught, my first was waitressing. So I took a course at Harvard Summer School. Then the second one was teaching at Gazelle Institute for Child Development in New Haven. So mm -hmm. I <laughs> took a course there um, at Yale. And then I, for some reason, went home and stayed home for a quarter as I did some stat a statistics job. And I took a course at Williams. And then the fourth one was at the Peace Corps, the beginning of the Peace Corps with JFK. And I found out later Oliver Papineau was an Antioch alum, and he was head of the Near East South Asia branch. So that's where I got my co-op job, which was the most exciting of all. Oh my God. Yeah. And it was so exciting that I made actually what I consider the biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> it's actually two mistakes together. <laughs> I dropped out of Antioch after three, well, I dropped out of Antioch. I was into, I think starting my third year. It was five years then. So maybe it was starting my fourth year. Anyway, I dropped out of Antioch and I got married to this Antioch guy who wanted to go to the Peace Corps. <laughs> Only to find out he screwed up short. Long story short, he screwed up. We went through the training project. Um, he screwed up, had to drop that, damn it. <laughs> and oh God, I 
you know, that was, that was a huge mistake on my part. And he turned out not to be the most mentally healthy person in the Agreed. world. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, I can I can move you through the next decade very quickly. I have it okay. wrapped up in a, like two sentences. We moved to a, the country in a house we bought for five and a half thousand dollars back then. Wait, this uh, was you and the and the husband that the you husband had. the first husband the Antioch guy. Um, we outside of Amherst in the country. I had two babies. I uh, did a lot of painting. I got my bachelor's in political science from, from University of Massachusetts because they were free and the husband refused to go back to Antioch. <laughs> and my parents weren't paying for it anymore because I'd done this dropping out and getting married thing. <laughs> so I, I got my degree in political science, but their department was God awful, just awful. And I spent all my time in the art building and in entomology, I loved, I grew love entomology. Oh my God. I remember the first <laughs> time I saw an insect under a microscope. <laughs> I ended up being a lab assistant in entomology of all things. Uh -huh. So I got the bachelor's there and then, um, and, I, and I worked as a stringer for the Amherst record. Mm. But we kept mm -hmm. that going in there. And that's the end of that decade. Got divorced. Um, started working full time as a newspaper reporter. Uh, I met I met on a blind date a smart and sexy New York Jewish guy, <laughs> which is about as far from Williamstown as you can get. Uh, I met him on a blind date for our per first pa my first Passover, which is, I mean this has enriched my life. He's a Holocaust survivor. The whole thing mm. is just pretty amazing. Mm. Um, we got married. Kids and the kids and I moved down to New Jersey, lived to live with him. Got married. Um, I got another degree in art education. See, I'm worming my way back <laughs> <laughs> at Ramapo College. And then I discovered while I was doing that, I discovered printmaking, which is really what I love. I love, love, love printmaking. And if I hadn't started writing plays, I would still be making prints. Um, it's very physical, which I kind of like. Uh, living in Northern New Jersey, I taught at a small art college, and then I got involved in community theater through state, doing set design. And then I got involved, well, they got me on stage, which I wasn't crazy about, but <laughs> I started going, uh, being part of the script committee. They did original musicals using, made up new lyrics to old tunes, but new scripts to hold it together. Uh -huh like 200 people on stage. This is a big deal. And I ended up, I didn't like a lot of their scripts. And so I ended up kind of taking over script committee. And then that gets you up to me being 50 years old. When I went to, when I got my graduate degree in playwriting, I moved to New York City, got a graduate uh -huh. degree in playwriting from Antioch University, which <laughs> can be explained. It wasn't a bad bad thing yet <laughs> but I saw it coming when I was on the alumni board I, I sure as heck saw it coming um, but the good thing about Antioch University then nobody had ever gotten a graduate degree in playwriting before so I pretty much had in fact I, I ended up making up all my own learning components and they used what I made up for their pattern for anybody after me doing that well, I don't know what they're doing now. Um, but I, so I studied, I took all of my, they're not classes, but you know, you put this and this here, we are collaborating this and this, and this together for each of the components. And they were all um, from either professionals in theater in New York or professional theater schools in New York. Um, so I had people like Mile instead, who was the head of graduate playwriting at Yale with a, sort of private, private stuff. Hmm. So I, I learned quite a bit. And, and then I moved, well, the kids had graduated. They're both musicians. Hmm. They were, they're off, went off to college and graduated and they were on their own. My husband retired when he was 45, which is huh. absurd. So I moved to New York. We moved to New York and um, 
that's it. Oh, oh, one other thing though, I insisted even back then, I before Antioch University was dirty words, I insisted on walking through the undergraduate line for graduation. Michael Moore was the speaker that year. Uh -huh. And that's how I know some of the younger people at Antioch. Uh -huh. So here we are. So let's talk about some of your, um, your artwork. Well, I just, here I go interrupting. You're starting out with uh, fabric <laughs> design, right? Susan? There. Oberlin. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't say Oberlin, but it is. Okay. Do you want to talk about okay, that? Okay. Okay. Collaboration again. I, uh, right in the beginning, when I started writing plays, I discovered the International Center for Women Playwrights, which is just meet online, but there are many, many women all over the world who belong. And um, I met Maureen Brady Johnson, who's a playwright who still lives out there, you know, out there with y'all in Ohio. <laughs> um, and she was, she is an incredible photographer. She's mainly a photographer or a photographer first. And she saw my fabric. I, I, I had been designing, I'd started when I was in New York, designing fabric textile designs online because I was dying to do some kind of artwork. Um, and she, I, I, I know, I asked her for a couple of her photographs to see if I could make them, use them for designs, for making fabric designs, the image, you know, alter it a little, alter it, do this and that. And she said, yeah, and she loved the fabric designs. So I ended up making quite a few. This uh, is a, an example of one where her, her picture is that lock. It's, it's an absolutely beautiful picture. And that's the fabric design that if you could see it more closely, closer, fabric design I made using her image. And she's the one who, who took them to a gallery and we were offered a show. It was a gorgeous show with, with her photos and my textile designs that were like, what's the right word? Made, not made from them, but inspired by, but also using the images that she captured. That's great. It was, it was very exciting. So let's go to the next slide. Oh, that's just an example of one of my, it's, it's quite an early one, but it's a good example because it's segueing into my playwriting where I use a lot of, a lot of nature and birds, particularly, I don't know more birds than any other animals, but I have, I have quite a few plays. Actually, the one that I just finished, finally, finally, the final rewrite yesterday. <laughs> the characters include two goats and a German short-haired and a German short-haired pointer. <laughs> the, the audio script, I've been going through a crazy week here, the audio script full length that I finished within the last week, the characters are a, a wolf, a rabbit, a crow, and a plant, and a glacier. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and the bird's my favorite, the crow is my favorite color, the tragic crow. <laughs> so, so it all just kind of weaves together, and it's kind of nice to see. This also is a good example of how important it is for me. I see it as part of maybe a scene from a play. You can tell or maybe you can't. What is that sky? Is there a forest fire? Or is it sunset? Whatever it is, the birds are paying attention and it's it's not just sitting there. It's something's going on. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. in my plays, I like to say, when I have the character list, I also often will put that lights and sound are also characters because uh -huh. they're so important. And I would add movement to that. Um, which I started seeing showing up in my artwork. Lights, and can, of course you can't have sound in that. So lights and movement. So let's go to the next slide. There we got movement. Um, this is the, 
I think the last, it's a mono print and it's the last print I actually did, not counting the textile designs because you make those online. I mean, physically made. And I have it because it's since before this, I was keeping my files of all my artwork in you know, the old fashioned way with on slides. Um, this one I have hanging in my living room. So, you know, it's recent and boy, has that got lights that I think that has sound too and movement. And also it has a um, kind of a timeless quality, which figures in my plays too. I love seeing how I never did this before, Paula, before you <laughs> started this, I never thought about how they, closely they tie together the art mm. and the plays. I, I know I'm very visual and in plays, I know that the set setting where they are, the environment is, is extremely important, but I never thought of how they overlapped in with, with my artwork. Okay, let's go next. That's one of my very early prints. When I first discovered how much I loved printmaking, that's an old IBM card that oh. I, I built up and then the birds are etching and the eggs. Now see, that doesn't have any movement, but I've, I've figured out how to justify that because they're eggs, right? There is going to be movement. <laughs> okay, next. Okay, that's one of the last ones too. And there I'm trying, I mean, I don't call this hugely successful by any means, but it's also showing an attempt at movement and old and young together. I, I have a, a, a guess, I, I didn't even realize it, a strong desire or need or something to pull the past into the present and the future um, in the big picture of things through through looking at you know stories small stories it's because it's all in there um okay let's go i, I think we go to plays now well yeah. there okay yeah well, that, yeah, that's my autobiographical play. So that's a picture of me when I was a kid and me when I was, when I wrote the play, I was older. Now I'm even older. Is, um, that, is that the Green River? No, that's just a pond. I, I think that's Frog Pond. We used to go skating in the winter, uh -huh. you know, shovel it off yourself and then skate. Um, I like this picture though. I, my si I didn't make this. My sister, my third down sister made this image. She's an artist. And I don't know, remember the significance of the keys, but she must have felt something like the, the young person is the key to the older one or something like that. Okay. Um, now you said it, it touches on Antioch. Oh, sorry. Actually, it's not uh, not just that one. A lot of them touch on Antioch. It's um, that autobiographical one is the only one. It was the hardest play to write of all, the hardest full length. Um, and it's hard because it took me through that falling in love at Antioch and the Peace Corps. And then he actually um, had, was schizophrenic. And it oh. was really, it was pretty bad. Uh, and I go through the really bad stuff, including the night I left, which was just, you know, not good. Um, and well, that's probably, you know, if you had gone to Nepal and then been there. Oh, God. It would have been a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're, so I, you're right. I'm sure it was anyway. Yeah. Well, I didn't realize, you know, I didn't know anything then. And I didn't realize that it's in their your 20s that usually schizophrenia really bursts out. And so I, and also, I mean, I was 21 when we got married. You know, when you're 21, you can do anything. My plan, get married, and they go to Nepal, come back and go to Antioch, you know? Yeah. Well, I learned a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I got the darn play written and it was, um, it was 
all about finding yourself and trying to be who you want to be, which I find is a, a theme repeated in one or, or more, maybe in maybe in four or five of my full length plays. Some, a woman wants to be a violinist in one. A woman wants to be an artist in another. Um, struggling to realize yourself is probably the biggest struggle we all have, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay, next slide. Duh. Um, you asked me about this because I think you want to ask me where I get my ideas from. Uh huh. Um, and this is a good example of that. Uh, this this was a one act play at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, and the actress who is pictured there played everybody from the cat, who is the narrator and who tells us the whole story as well as acting in it. Um, and she played that and all the other characters mm -hmm. in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. um, and then it went on and, and back to New York and it grew to a full length play. Um, the Edinburgh version was um, in off Broadway too. Um, where did I get my idea? The cat, Turbo, belonged to my sister who was three years younger who had can got cancer and gave me her cat to take care of. And of course I ended up keeping him because she died. So it's, it, it's inspired by my sister dying but it's not a sad play. Um, it's about me taking over the cat, only it's not really me. And the, the struggles that this person has then to deal with not only the cat, but with other things in life that, that become complicated because of having this cat. Um, the cat is, it's kind of an interesting way into the story um, because it's not seeing it from a person's point of view. There's a lot of really emotional stuff in there. And if you think you're seeing it from the cat's point of view, it sneaks up on you better. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So you've talked about structure in your works to me. Um, how does this fit into your, the, the way you use structure and build on it? I, I think, you know, you get your ideas from, uh, people ask you where you get your ideas all the time. They ask me, oh my God. And I say, <laughs> I say, there's too many. The hard part is choosing uh -huh. what, what to write about. And for anybody who's going to write plays, what I do, this is what I think needs to be done. They need, you need to have certain things that you can do, structure is one of them. Um, first, you have to be able, will, the, will this make, will this present, can this play you're thinking of writing present a major dramatic question, the MDQ. I learned this from Mylan Stitt. Um, uh -huh. The major dramatic question, you know, is something like, will the will girl get boy? Will, um, Oh, in the, the goat play, it's will, will Jilly be able to get out of her storybook life and live a real life in New York City? Uh -huh. um, I mean, she's literally in a storybook, kept a character in a storybook to uh -huh. begin with. Um, will Harmony get through an audition? Will Margie escape the expandable pig? That's a <laughs> Margie escaping this, that's a play. And um, will the nest hawk be saved? Lola and Pale Male were red, real red wings in New York City with a 50 pound nest on the cornice of a fancy exclusive East Side apartment building. Woody Allen lived across the street. Mary Tyler Moore and Paula Zahn, the new newscaster, lived in the building that eventually did tear the, the nest down. Mm -hmm. uh, and this got worldwide attention. Well, this is great. The hawks aren't in the play, but that influences everything that goes on in the play. And it's about, it's called pecking order. Mm -hmm. Who gets to live in this apartment building? Not the doorman who thinks he's going to be there someday, you know, uh -huh. not. But then it's, it's fabulous because Mary Tyler Moore and Paula Zahn can go head to head in a meeting. So 
<laughs> you know, the, the, there I got the idea from the Hawks. You asked me though, what about what I have to think about when I decide to write a play? Well, with, does it have a good major dramatic question? Yeah. Um, can I put this in a structure that will that will speak to what it's about. Now the structure needs to be, of course, in order to do any kind of art, you have to be really good at the basics. And there's a very quite rigid basic structure of when you have to have the major dramatic question known to the audience by page 10, preferably. Hmm. Um, this, the, if the audience doesn't know what the question is, why they're sitting there, what's the question? What is this story going to be? And when it it ends, you know, you always have a feeling when a story ends that it's ending. But if you don't know what the heck you're there for or what the story is, that's boring. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the structure has to be good and tight on a basic level, and then you can spread your wings. Like I, I, mine is, mine are all magical realism. They're not, you know, tied entirely to realism by any means, but I have to have that realistic basic structure in place. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm covering points that a beginning playwright should, should be sure to cover, having taught in Mongolia. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. Yeah, they asked me again and I just can't take the jet lag. Um, you need this is this is interesting action action show don't tell people are always talking about action when i was taking first taking playwriting and i swear nobody told me what kind of action they were talking about for two years or so it was <laughs> they're not talking about fist fights and running and and that they're talking about what you have to have is not great dialogue the dialogue has to only be there if it's moving forward what that person who's saying it wants everybody has a want mm -hmm. and an action is saying i'm not going to tell you my name what was important there wasn't the sentence it was what i was saying it for and boy do i mean it that's you got to have be able to have good action in this play mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and act can i throw in here the one thing i think i know i'm jumping ahead a, a new playwright should absolutely read a book about basic playwriting um stuart spencer has one i always recommend called the Play playwright's guidebook which mm. is available and the other book that's just lovely for all writers is Bird by Bird by Annie Lamont. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love yeah. that. And finally, networking is, is hugely important. Maybe the most important thing. If you're, once you're, you know your craft, and that's w, why it's W-R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G for the people playwright, because it's a craft. Once you know your craft, although I think you learn, you know, I, I'm never going to stop learning. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like rewriting. <laughs> Once you, you know that, though, the important thing is to network like crazy. So let's move on to uh, the next play. Ah. Uh, um, I consider this Humans Remain my best play, and it will probably never be produced. I wrote it before everyone, before not everyone, but it became incorrect for white lady like me to write about black people. This play is about the Ramapo mountain people. When I lived in Northern New Jersey, in the mountains there, there are people called the Ramapo mountain people who live apart from civilization by choice. Um, and they're black because they're photographs. Um, but nobody knows anything about them much. So I wrote a book and I made up um, a very disparate culture for them. 
Um, I don't have them all black. They're, they're people who are descended from, oh, people, cross that up. They're people who have escaped from jail, who are draft dodgers, people like that, who for one mm -hmm. reason or another, or who just plain old don't want to be around other people in you know the money culture. Um, and a, a young white man who's studying to be a doctor, but he's really bad at it. He keeps not getting into graduate school. He discovers them and he goes up on their mountain and the play is about him. He thinks, oh great, I can rescue them. Uh -huh. So it, it, a lot of it goes back to my thinking during the civil rights movement and, and then what's been happening now um, with white people thinking they can save black people, you know, uh, and he, in the end, they kick him out and they choose, even though he discovers that they have Lyme disease and it's, uh, it's really decimating their tribe. Uh -huh. um, and he says, well, I'll go back to New York and I'll tell everybody about you and they'll get medicine for you. And, you know, that would be the end of their civilization, their self-created civilization. Uh -huh. And the young woman who's the head of the tribe, the watcher, she, she tells him to leave. So... But, but this is never going to be produced. The editor loves it. Well, yeah. I asked him before. It, it, it went through rehearsals for a, and had a staged reading in New York City. And Stephen McKinley, McKinley Henderson, who has been in many, many August Wilson plays, and, you know, he's Black. The whole cast was Black when they did this, except for the one character. They thought it was great. They had no problems, and they dissected it. I was afraid they were going to find things where I'd said something I un, you know didn't know that I shouldn't have or got something totally wrong. They actually found a couple of um, places where it had uh, folklore in it that I didn't even know was there uh -huh. that I had put uh -huh. there. So that's, that's the story. That's available if anybody wants to get it from, you know, the, the link is on my website. But that question about kind of the politics of representation Oh, it's just become a massive issue in all, you know, in writing, I mean, art, everything. Well, let's move on. Yeah, I have more to say about that if somebody wants to talk about it later. But let's talk about breasts. Oh, boobies. Yeah. <laughs> this was inspired by a, a young woman who was in a play of mine, uh, who was in Alice in Black and White down in Louisville um, at the the big art center there she got breast cancer and had to have both breasts amputated removed and then she got reconstruction and she um had a, a blog through that whole thing this was, uh -huh. this was before i knew her but though i saw the blog later um very positive really you know what <laughs> she was she was incredible but that was inspirational and at the same time as I found out about that experience with her, I found out about seeing the lower right-hand corner, that woman is, I think I saw this online somewhere, that woman is holding what's called a breast washer over one boob. Uh, when was it those were? I, oh, I'm no good on dates, but they were maybe in the um, 30s uh -huh. or 20s. They came up with this thing in France called the breast washer and women were buying them like crazy what it had was a um i mean i looked this up, did all my research it it had like a little feather attachment that would whirl around and it was obviously a lot more for self-pleasure than for washing <laughs> <laughs> so i started out with a monologue by a woman selling them um uh -huh. and then i i thought well we got the vagina monologues why not the breast monologues and i ended up i mean there's all ages and all kinds of stories mm. um and it's good it was done at um a pittsburgh theater during the pandemic because it's good for you know zoom because they're all almost there's a few duo logs but they're mostly all monologues uh -huh. And then I wrote another full length, which is Margie and the Expandable Pig, um, which is Margie is from South Carolina on the coast. She's a big woman, a really big woman, and is ashamed of her body. 
people, I mean, you see in the play kids and people saying nasty things to her. Um, so she decides she's just going to go back to her cabin and never come out on Ocean Isle, North Carolina. And um, her breasts are afraid <laughs> that, I mean, if she dies, they die, right? And so they've got to do something about her situation. She, they're afraid she's going to kill herself. So um, I see Jessica's question. Yes, Jessica. <laughs> so um, throughout the play, there her two Margie's two breasts put the call out. They're Lucy and Ramona, left and right, right. They put the call <laughs> out on the worldwide women's breast network that they, a woman needs help. And the rest of the characters in the play are all pairs of breasts from many different places <laughs> who come and um, encourage her in various ways. One of my favorites is this um, pair of little bitty breasts on a little bitty, on a girl. She's like 13 and they haven't, she wants them to grow, they're little. And she, <laughs> well, anyway, they have encouraging things to say. That's great. Um, okay, let's move on. Uh, this is my most successful play. It's about Alice Austin, who grew up on Staten Island, so I could go. It was the first house built on Staten Island, and she lived her whole life there. So I went and saw, she was the first photo journal, woman photojournalist, and they have all these copies of all her, her photos. So I went and looked and um, discovered also, in addition to her story being interesting, white woman, Staten Island, she was gay. Mm. And this was back way before, way before you let anybody know. So as soon as all her relatives died off, she, her, Gertrude, her woman, moved in. But it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful story. And that's been, that ran off Broadway and um, it's had productions all over the world. And it's at Original Works Publishing. Co colleges do a really good job with this. I found colleges have great, you know, fabulous technical departments, te kids who want to be technicians, and they do really, really inventive, fabulous, fabulous tech work. Okay, let's move on. Oh, this is a short one. This is 10 minute plays are really big, as everybody probably knows. And um, I, I have tons of those. This one, I saw a bowerbird nest in Australia. Um, and this one, he has is, he is barely started. He just constructed it. He hasn't even decorated it. I, this, I, this is not my photograph. This is from somewhere online. But they will, the males will co construct these and then elaborately decorate them with flower petals and glass, blue glass is the biggest and make, an, you know, path leading up to it and gorgeous to see who can attract the female, whose bower is most attractive to the female. <laughs> this play just won um, Short and Sweet, which is a big festival in Australia, um, which is quite a coup and it's been published. Uh -huh. uh, I ought to say here that being published is not what you want to do um, until you, I've, I've done it once a play has been done frequently enough so that I don't, I don't want to have to deal with it anymore. I want to work on getting my new ones produced. Um, most theater companies that want new plays, not only want not for it not to be published, but they want to have the premiere um, for publicity purposes for themselves. So once something's published, it, uh -huh. it go to a certain market, but I can't, I can't send it out anymore. So. Uh -huh. Oh, this is my newest publication. Uh, Next Stage Press is a new, new outfit. Um, this has three of my activist plays. Uh, one is Grace, uh, Fortification of Miss Grace Wren, which is, um, I got inspired by a statue of Peter Stuyvesant in the, down in the village in New York. Um, he was not the sweetest guy. He was the first governor general of New York City. And he was, he was not a sweet guy by any means. But he gives strength and inspiration. The statue comes alive to this teacher who saw like teachers did in, in New York who were down in the 
fairly near the World Trade Center, which the anniversary is tomorrow. They saw it and their kids saw it happen. And so this, this teacher in my play is so traumatized by the children saying, what is that strange bird, Miss Wren? What is that bird that's not jumping off the building, falling? Oh my God. So she doesn't want to go back. She can't bring herself to go back once they start school again because she's afraid of the children's questions. And mm -hmm. Peter Stuyvesant gives her the strength to face it. Cool. Uh, that's one of them. One of them is Blood Sisters, which has been done a million times all over the place. It's three activist nuns based on true, um, true stuff. They that's one we did at yeah, uh, you did that. Reunion. That's right. Yeah. They uh, they went and <clears throat> broke into a nuclear missile silo and hammered on the silo cover and got arrested. And and one of them died recently. I think she was still in jail or in jail mm -hmm. again. Um, they were convicted. Um, so this is them. The planning. Thing. Yeah. And yeah. you know, um, recently the two who are alive saw a production of it and wrote to me. And I thought, oh, geez, because I totally made their characters up. But they're public figures, so you can do that. And the third one is Occupy, exclamation point, which totally was inspired by the Occupy Wall Street movement that we had here in the city, where a whole a tent city was put up down by Wall Street. And in my play, some of them decide they're going to have a, a new script to, to a Shakespearean play and um, act it out as the people are Wall Streeters are going to work in the morning yeah. and show them, you know, just how bad they are and how awful they are. This is my other real, real, real popular one. Um, Briefly, it's about, you get insp inspiration everywhere, right? This is about Ridgewood, New Jersey, where I lived with my husband and the kids when they were growing up. It's a very, very conservative, it was back then, very conservative, very proper. Oh my God. Um, as I say, there were, whenever there was an election, there would be a local election, there'd be three democratic votes. And my <laughs> husband and I would wonder who the other person was, you know? <laughs> Uh, and this is three children who are being brought up there by their super, super conservative mother. Uh, and this has been done at lots of colleges. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. I love, I love this play. <laughs> it used to be called Embracing the Undertoad. And under that title, it won the Lesbian Theater Initiative. And I'm not lesbian, but it won anyway up in Chicago at Bailiwick Theater. Um, mm -hmm. But I needed to... Actually, when I wrote this, as with a few, number of my other plays, I don't attack, uh, I mean, I'm not lesbian. I can't, I don't know what it's like to be lesbian. And this is part of our discussion about woke culture and all. Right. I don't feel I can write a play with the protagonists, protagonists, protagonists who are not straight. And I can write men, I think, but straight white is basically what I feel have for my protagonists. However, this protagonist is gay, her girlfriend is gay, and her sister is basically my sister who is any any gender you want at any time or any gender she wants at any time or no gender. And so I could write her. Uh, but this is like not a controversial thing. It's not nothing controversial that enters into the play about sexual yeah. orientation at all. These people just happen to be Ooh, and right. living together yeah. and they go through a, a big problem. I had to change the title, damn it. I really like embracing the undertow, but it didn't fit anymore after I did rewrites. Did you say undertow or undertowed? Well, yeah, I said undertowed, but it's because <laughs> when the sisters were kids, they, they called the undertow the undertowed, I, which right. my sister and I did. <laughs> That's the hawk play I told you about. That's Lola uh -huh. and Pale Male. And in this, the love interest, the girl, is actually a bird who bams into the glass door at the apartment building and becomes a bird. Or no, she becomes a girl. And then, and then after she has this 
mad, falls madly in love with a doorman who falls madly in love with her. She kind of did what she needed to do and she, the migration is leaving. So she leaves, hmm. but it's about that play. That play just had a really, really, oh my God, good Zoom reading. I have to say it was good uh -huh. um, in Florida at Jackson, Jacksonville University. The young director was incredible and the actors were just out of this world. Hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm still in touch with them. I'm hoping I can do some more work with them. Because uh -huh. pecking order is, um, I'm sure that's going to be produced soon. I've sent it out to quite a few places. Yeah, I like that play. This is, okay, here we go with the appropriation thing. And I feel like I didn't really, I mean, I'm married to a Jewish guy. And I've always wondered how people who are second and third generation descendants of Holocaust victims, how it's affected them. Because I don't, I, I'm always trying to figure out how it's affected my husband, right? So this is a play for five women who don't know each other, but, and, and one of them is a Holocaust victim, the older, the older woman, but they, she's never talked about it, never will not talk about it, hasn't come to terms with dealing with her granddaughter who lives with her. She won't, anyway, these women come together and they're, they are different generations of descendants and they work out things in their lives through getting together. Are they all Jewish? Yeah, oh yeah, they're all second and third generation descendants oh, yeah. right. of Jews right. who were there. Um, this had, um, a reading in New York at a Jewish place and everybody, you know, you know, nobody said anything was wrong with it. I didn't step on any toes or do anything wrong. And then it had a reading in Berlin. Um, the director at that time was a German guy and that went really well. He said, I didn't go, he went. Um, so it's waiting to be done. What's the, what are the mechanics of you know, once you've written a play to your oh, satisfaction, yeah. what's next? What do you do? Okay, well, a lot. It's um, it's a long haul. And some plays, of course, it's longer than others. Um, basically, you write a first draft. And then I, I founded a playwriting feedback group, development group, um, some 20 some years ago that is still meeting. Uh, and I, I belong to several other groups as well, but it's really important to have a, a group who will give you no nonsense feedback, you know, not just say, oh, it's good, it's sweet. One of the groups I belong to tends to do that. Um, it's not helpful. Uh, it's also not helpful to listen to people who aren't on your wavelength. They're not giving you what your play needs. They're giving you what a play they write would be like. Uh, or they will, uh -huh. you know, they try to rewrite your play. But this process, go, you know, you listen to feedback, you make notes, you've got your own thoughts, and go back and you rewrite. I've, I have a play. I have something like twenty rewrites. Um, the one I just finished had six. Uh, you, you know, you rewrite, rewrite. You go back and you have it read. You, you'd have a scene. Most groups will. You can only read a couple scenes, maybe maximum twenty pages for the evening. Um, so eventually you need to have a reading of the full thing to see if it had the arc works, to see how it works. Um, you know, the, the obstacles should grow through the play, um, all kinds of things that as, the, as in the order that characters are introduced, ideally that will be the, int the order in which their plays, you know, the last one to be introduced, that person's story and story arc will end first. Not that they're out of the play, but just yeah. their story ends. Um, so that your protagonist, who you who you know about first, so that's the end, the ending, right? I also Things just like finished a full length audio script. That's the one with the wolf, rabbit, crow, plant, uh, glacier. Um, that they asked for at a place called the Parsnip Ship in Brooklyn that does a, I mean, it's an audio but they do a live recording with the audience there and they have a 
musician who composes music to go with it. Uh. And I'm hoping that, and, and they, they're paying everybody 125 bucks for, for this, which is great, including me, which is really great. Um, and I'm hoping this director will have the individuals on the stage do the sound effects because there's thunder and, and floods and all kinds of all kinds of great sound effects in that. The wind is a character, for example. He doesn't appear, but you hear him. Uh, so it depends. It depends. And then you go that then you go, that's a just a reading, sit down reading. Then you go to getting a staged reading. Um, if you don't, or you can go straight for a production. Stay, if you can get a staged reading, and I have a, somebody that's doing a staged reading of a play of mine coming up, which is, is lucky that they asked for it, because um, that'll tell you even more. Um, I was calling it illuminating tomorrow, but then I realized, nah, I think um, I want to get the rabbit, wolf, rabbit, crow, and I, it now has a plant in there. Um, oh, by the way, this is good for kids, but this is good for grownups. But my other one that I just finished, this is the, this is not the goat play, obviously. It's all these other animals. The goat play that I just finished is, is for kids full length. And it's an audio script also for like nine, age nine and up because uh -huh. there's sex and stuff in there. <laughs> but there's no swear words. It's very interesting when you send stuff, scripts out, what you can say, the words you can say in New York and get away with are very different from what you can say in the Midwest or down South. Um, and what I have instead of swear words, there's a troll in this. He's got a filthy mouth, but he says things like, oh, schnibblewitz, <laughs> uh, you know. That's and, and and the the girl goes, oh. <laughs> you know, and his mouth should be washed out with soap. Um, so I don't have any any of the bad swear words, but he, nonetheless, I had to put a a little thing on the character page that says, if any of the bad were bad words, are too bad for you. <laughs> I don't say that, but I say you can change them. <laughs> I mean, damn is no good in a lot of places i just noticed the time paula oh yeah i oh should my have god been yeah i guess let's let's zoom through the rest yeah i'll zoom oh okay there's that um website has descriptions of everything <clears throat> your website yeah yeah okay um so um, well, I think we have to end. I, okay, um, so let's open it to questions. <laughs> I, I had two questions. One is, how did you get your very first play produced on a stage? And the second is the economics, which uh, you only mentioned one $125 thing. Actually, <laughs> this, I would like to I say, I never, ever, ever pay a fee to submit a play. A lot of theaters are doing this to raise money on the backs of playwrights, uh, which is just not fair. You know, they'll charge like $10, $25 to submit your play to maybe and probably not be produced. No, no, no. Uh -huh. um, oh, it was the Antioch <laughs> play at the Yellow Springs play. It was published by Samuel French eventually. It was uh -huh. Eating Primrose in Ohio that is a takes place in the laundromat that used to be at Annie, in, the, in the village where we used to have to lug our laundry down because they didn't have any washers on campus. And it was it's about a boy who I had, had imagined ran the laundromat and a girl who was from the college, only it's not Antioch College, it's a, like a snooty, snooty school. <laughs> and she comes down to the laundromat, yeah. And they watched the evening primrose open together. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's yes, I forgot. Yes. Right. Yeah, I've read that play. It was uh, in some anthology. Um I don't even know about that. Really? Well, I'll try to see what it is and let you know. Please do. If I can dredge it up. Well, we want to thank you. Oh, thank so you. Much. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful.